Job chapter 20, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 3, we read, Zophar the Namathite answered and said, Therefore my anxious thoughts make me answer, because of the turmoil within me. I have heard the rebuke that reproaches me, and the spirit of my understanding causes me to answer. Job has been pouring out his heart as we've been going through this book together. We have seen this, that he had just been pouring out his heart to his friends. Because to be honest with you, as we've gone through the chapters up to this point, his friends have been heartless. He had asked the question in chapter 19, verse 2. He had asked them, how long will you torment my soul? In other words, he is saying to them at that point, you've wronged me. You've exalted yourselves against me. And then in verse 21 of chapter 19, he had said, Have pity on me, O you my friends, for the hand of God has struck me. In other words, you haven't seen that what has happened to me is, is not because of my sin that you keep accusing me of, but the reason that I have been tormented in this way, the reason that I've gone through these things is because these things are from the hand of God. So in spite of all his pain and in spite of all his trouble, Job had actually closed, as we saw last time, with a word of faith and hope. Look at chapter 19, and we'll read those things that he had said. He said in verse 25 of chapter 19, I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. I look forward to seeing him. Notice how he had said in verse 26, after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. By saying this, he was stating, I fully believe in the physical bodily resurrection. Now I want to share some things with you that I didn't share with you last time as a way of filling in some information and leading to uh, chapter 20. He's speaking concerning a resurrection. After my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. He's speaking of a physical, bodily resurrection. When you read your Bible, you'll note some things, some very basic things, and one of the things you note is that the idea of resurrection is found in the Old Testament, but it is not fully revealed to us in the Old Testament. And so, the events described in Job, we need to remember, took place around 2,000 years before Jesus. And I mentioned to you in our introduction that the book of Job is recognized as the earliest book of the Bible. It was possibly written by Moses, because Moses is recording events that took place so long ago. And because it is the earliest book of the Bible, the resurrection had not yet been fully revealed. You'll see in the Old Testament, and I'm not going to try and take you through all the verses, but you'll see in other Old Testament books that resurrection is alluded to or spoken of. For example, when you look at the Psalms, uh, David in Psalm 16 verse 10 had written, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. David wrote that about a thousand years before Christ. The uh, sons of Korah, which uh, they're a group of those who had written some of the Psalms. The, the sons of Korah in Psalm 49, verse 15, said, God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. He shall receive me. So you can see early on that there were comments made concerning this resurrection. When you look at Daniel, which was written 600 years or so before Christ, Daniel chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, Daniel wrote, Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. You look in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah was written about 740 years before Christ. Isaiah 26, 19 says, Your dead will live, their bodies will rise, you who dwell in the dust, wake up and shout for joy. Your dew is like the dew of the morning. The earth will give birth to her dead. So you see this in Scripture, allusions to 
the resurrection in the Old Testament. When you begin to look at the New Testament, Jesus spoke of the resurrection, taught his apostles concerning it. He said in John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, marvel not at this, the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good to the resurrection of life and they that have done evil to the resurrection of judgment or damnation. He said in John 6, 39 and 40, this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. My Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Resurrection, Jesus taught it. You see it in the Old Testament. You see it in the New Testament. And then Paul gave us insight into resurrection when he spoke of resurrection because with resurrection is judgment or reward. In Romans 2, verses 5 through 10, he said, because of your stubbornness, your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will give to each person according to what he's done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, but glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. So Job was actually giving a very early statement of faith concerning a resurrection that would later be revealed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so what he was saying is, I am looking forward to my own resurrection. What does that mean? That means that those who are righteous are going to be resurrected and receive reward. And he expected to receive reward. He was not expecting a resurrection of judgment. And so as he was speaking concerning this, he had made it very clear. I'm living right before God. But even though I'm living right before the Lord, I'm still being tried. And since I'm being tried, you need to be careful yourself. You need to be aware of the fact that you too are going to be tried by the Lord. And so as he has said that, Zophar didn't like it. So in verse 1 of chapter 20, Zophar the Namathite answered and said, Therefore my anxious thoughts make me answer, because of the turmoil within me. I've heard the rebuke that reproaches me and the spirit of my understanding causes me to answer. No, no, it's not my flesh at all. It's the spirit of my understanding. Now, he's responding in flesh because he is, he's been uh, insulted. He's upset. Why? Because Job had told him God might judge them. Because in verse 29, Job had closed when he had said in chapter 19, be afraid of the sword for yourselves. For wrath brings the punishment of the sword, that you may know there is a judgment. So he, Job had actually warned them, because you guys are saying, I'm being judged. You better take care of yourself. You better look at yourself before you start pointing your finger at me. Remember, you've got three fingers pointing at yourself. And they didn't like that. And so when he said, be afraid of the sword, and he speaks of the sword, being, it says, wrath brings the punishment of the sword. The word sword or, or the image of a sword is, is, is used in this particular case as a picture of justice and a picture of judgment. And he was warning them that they themselves were going to go through judgment. And so Zophar is upset about that. And he says, my anxious thoughts make me answer. Uh, I've been stirred up by your words. You've made me angry, so I'm going to respond. Now, in spite of your distress, in spite of your affliction, <laughs> what you have said has ticked me off. He didn't say that exactly, but that's what he means in the Hebrew. <laughs> You've ticked me off. So he goes on and he says in verse 3, I've heard the rebuke that reproaches me, and the spirit of my understanding causes me to answer. I have been insulted, and that is provoking me to respond. I can't let you shift your own guilt upon us. 
I want you to notice this. Without any compassion, Zophar begins to rail against Job. And what he's going to do, as, he, as we begin to read in a moment here, is he's calling him a hypocrite. That's what he's calling Job. He'll be doing that. I'll read verses 4 through 11. He goes on, and now his understanding causes him to answer. Do you not know this of old, since man was placed on earth, that the triumphing of the wicked is short, and the joy of the hypocrite is but for a moment? Though his haughtiness mounts up to the heavens and his head reaches to the clouds, yet he will perish forever like his own refuse. Those who have seen him will say, where is he? He will fly away like a dream and not be found. Yes, he will be chased away like a vision of the night. The eye that saw him will see him no more, nor will his place behold him anymore. His children will seek the favor of the poor and his hands will restore his wealth. His bones are full of his youthful vigor, but it will lie down with him in the dust. Very poetic way of insulting Job. He says in verse 4, Do you not know this of old since man was placed on earth? Do you not know this? This is common knowledge. Job, if you were so wise, you would already know this. Now, I'm just going to touch this for a second, but when he says, Speaking of being placed on earth, verse 4, do you not know this of old since man was placed on earth? You might want to remember that he is he was saying that uh, God created all things. He is not saying that there was an evolutionary process whatsoever. He's saying man was placed on earth. And he's saying since man was placed on earth, that implies that he was placed by somebody. And so that implies creation. So don't you understand this? We have known this from of old. And then he begins to share what he's wanting to rebuke him with. Verse 5, that the triumphing of the wicked is short. The joy of the hypocrite is but for a moment. When he says the triumphing, uh, the word triumph is, is used in the uh, Bible very often to speak of rejoicing. You're triumphing, you're rejoicing. It's a word that means rejoicing. So the rejoicing of the joy, the rejoicing of the wicked is short, it's short-lived. And so he's speaking concerning that, and he says the joy of the hypocrite is but for a moment. Now, that's not a new thought, the thought that, that, that people may have joy for a moment but lose it because life in itself is filled with things that are, are, are going to cause pain and all, and that somebody who's a hypocrite or a sinner, they may experience moments of joy, but it's not lasting. That's not a new thought. It's something that they've already been speaking about. We've seen it come out of the lips of Aliphaz as well as his other friend Bildad. Because in chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, Eliphaz had said, Consider now, who being innocent has ever perished? Where were the upright ever destroyed? As I have observed, those who plow evil and those who sow trouble reap it. He was letting them know that and anything you've done that was blessed in the beginning doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to last. Bildad, in chapter 8, verses 11 through 13, asked the question, Can papyrus grow tall where there's no marsh? Can reeds thrive without water? While still growing and uncut, they wither more quickly than grass. Such is the destiny of all who forget God. So perishes the hope of the godless. It's temporary. It doesn't last. So the triumphing of the wicked is short. Again, that's a common thought in the Bible. The joy of the self-deceiver does not last because it's not grounded in reality. It's like what the psalmist said in Psalm 37, verses 35 and 36, where he said, I have seen a wicked and ruthless man flourishing like a green tree in its native soil, but he soon passed away and was no more. Though I looked for him, he could not be found. For at one time he was really noticeable. He dressed well. He, he lived well. He perishes quickly because the joy of the hypocrite is short-lived. And so he's beginning to call Job, a hypocrite. He says in verse 6, Though his haughtiness mounts up to the heavens and his, his head reaches to the clouds, yet they will perish forever like his own refuse. Those who have seen him will say, Where is he? And though he attains the highest honors, and though people hold him in great dignity, it doesn't last. This hypocrite is going to perish forever. He's like his own refuse. That's a very polite way to put it which is disgusting, and is cast out. 
And it is going to be short-lived in such a way that people are going to ask, whatever happened to so-and-so? Do you guys ever do that? Marie and I will be talking and we'll say, I wonder whatever happened to such-and-so actor that we knew so well that everybody loved so much. Whatever happened to him? And that's basically what happens. We don't ever know, so we ask Google. Google. Google knows everything. And so I said, Mr. Google, what do you know? It goes on and it says in verse 8, it says, he will fly away like a dream and not be found. Yes, he will be chased away like a vision of the night. The eye that saw him will see him no more, nor will his place behold him anymore. When he says he'll fly away like a dream, he's going to be chased away. And that's another way of saying his life is temporary and, and it's also unstable. And leaves no lasting impression. It's interesting how he uses the phrase, a vision of the night. He will be chased away like a vision of the night. Uh, it's a, when he says a vision of the night, at first as I was reading this and looking at it, I thought, what's he referring to there? And so naturally I, I look at my commentators because these guys have been dead 150 years. They probably were scholars in their day, and I like to look at the old people. You know, somebody once said, if they're not dead, they're not read. So I like to have old people that I look at and see the ancient writings and all of that, or the old, older writings. And so I look it up. What does that phrase actually mean? And one of my commentators said, it's like when you wake up, and some of us have done this. I'm assuming all of us have at one time or another. You wake up, you're still half asleep, and you look and you think you see something in your room, you know, and so you blink your eyes a couple times, and you look and it's actually nothing there. You know, at first I thought it was the kukui, you know. Um, <laughs> every kid, who, everybody I know was raised with the concept of the boogeyman, and my mom just used the word kukui. And, and so she would tell me the kukui was in my room, to keep me from climbing out of bed. And so I was afraid because he, he lived under my bed. That's where he lived. And I can still remember standing at the door and getting to the light switch because if I could get to my bed in two steps, he didn't have time to reach out and grab me. A lot of you knew that. It worked. No, <laughs> he never grabbed me. And I, went to, I would do that every night. I would hit that, and then I'd try and outrun the light, you know. And so I don't know why I'm telling you that. It just came to mind right now. I'm old. <laughs> Allow me to ramble. But visions of the night. It's you think you see something in the darkness is what it is. And that's basically what he's saying. A vision of the night is what you have when you wake up and think that you see something. But the point he's making is your life is temporary. Your life is unstable. Your life of the life of the hypocrite will leave no lasting impression. So what we ought to do is be aware of, of how, how quickly our life passes. When you're very young, you think everything takes forever. When am I going to be able to? Everything takes forever. And you look for significant moments in your life. Maybe you're looking for your, your fifth birthday. Maybe you begin to think of your 12th birthday. Maybe you begin to look forward to your 16th birthday. Maybe you look forward to your 18th birthday. Then you look at your 21st birthday. You're always looking ahead, and it takes forever for you to get to these points. Then you get to be 40 or 50. Then you don't want your, your next birthday to come because you're now it's, oh. So things, are, things change. But one of the things you begin to realize over time is how, how fast life really does go. And so in James chapter 4, verse 14, James said, why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. And he asked the question, what is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Be aware of that. Be aware of how quickly your life really passes by. Because in verse 9, he's saying, he will be gone and he will be forgotten. It's that old phrase, out of sight, out of mind. In verse 10, his children will seek the favor of the poor and his hands will restore his wealth. And so they will be left, his children will be left without friends. And 
will seek to be friends with those whom the Father has injured. And ultimately, what's going to happen, he's saying, is they will give his money to those whom he had robbed by treating them unjustly. That's the point he's making. So his children will seek the favor of the poor or those he had robbed for himself to become rich, and his hands will restore his wealth. The children will give back to the poor whom he had robbed the things he had taken from them. In verse 11, his bones are full of his youthful vigor, but it will lie down with him in the dust. He's going to die in the prime of his life, and he's going to leave everything behind, Job. The hypocrite leaves everything behind, even as you are. Once again, he's saying this to him, and it's causing him great pain. In verse 12, he says, Though evil is sweet in its in his mouth, and he hides it under his tongue. Though he spares it and does not forsake it, but still keeps it in his mouth, yet his food in his stomach turns sour. It becomes cobra venom within him. When he speaks about evil being sweet, it's another way of saying he loves, he relishes evil. He devours it. He savors it the way a gourmet likes certain kinds of foods. So he relishes, he loves it. But evil ultimately will turn on him. Evil will sicken him. And evil will destroy him. And the result is going to be he will never have peace of mind and he will never have peace of heart. And now the Bible says in Isaiah 48, 22, there is no peace, saith the Lord, to the wicked. And in Romans 5, verses 1 and 2, it speaks of how we can have peace. It says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. See, before you have a relationship with the Lord, you ask yourself, and I ask myself, why don't I have peace? Why don't I have a moment's peace? Why is my life so messed up? I didn't have any peace. I don't know about you, but I didn't have any, and you didn't either, really, if you didn't know the Lord not real peace, not lasting peace. I didn't have that. I don't even remember moments of peace, frankly, from the time I was in my early teens until I got saved at the age of 20. I don't, I don't even remember having peace at all. And there is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. I mean, I, I didn't have a lasting peace of any sort. But what happened in my life, like yours too, I'm sure, is that was something I longed for. There were basically very simple things that I wanted in life. One of the things I wanted was, was love. Another thing I wanted in, in life was hope. And another thing I wanted in life was peace. Those are three things I wanted. I wanted love, I wanted hope, I wanted peace. And I didn't have any of those. And that's what caused my life to be so filled with turmoil. And that's why I, I, I eventually had to come to faith in Christ because there was no peace for me. And then I heard the gospel like you did. Then I heard the, me the message of the gospel. And when I heard the message of the gospel, when God spoke to me and said, I'm speaking to you, well, that changed my life. That changed my life. I, I was impressed one time. I heard a man by the name of, uh, of Barry McGuire. And uh, he was well known in the early 60s as a, a folk singer. And, and he went on his own and he, he uh, made a song many people in the early 60s were aware of. It was called uh, The Eve of Destruction. And some of you heard it. It was a very apocalyptic song for the, for the time. I was a kid when he brought it out. And so people would speak about that, you know, that the world is exploding, this and that. And later on, I got saved. And Barry McGuire was doing music at a church, and, and I went to it. And I'll never forget listening to Barry Maguire because Barry Maguire had pretty much everything people wanted. He was well-known. He, he had money. He had everything that a lot of people think will make them happy. He had all of that. And so he was playing. He had become a Christian, and he was playing at, at the church, and I went to the church to hear him. And I'll never forget what he said because he was, you know, again, he was a folk singer and this and that. And he was sharing how that one day he said, I was miserable, and I was walking down the street. He was somewhere in Hollywood. He said, as I was walking down the street there in Hollywood, he said, I came upon a man who was on a cross. This guy had set up a cross and was hanging there. 
And Barry McGuire, you know, is in the world. He's a worldly guy and everything. And he says, I couldn't help but go and look at him. He said, there's this guy on a cross. And he said, so I asked him, what are you doing on that cross? And the guy looked down, he said at me, and he said to me, he goes, are you, are you ready for Jesus? And Barry McGuire said, I looked at him and I said, I'm not even ready for you, you know. But he spoke to this guy and the guy gave him the gospel. And Barry McGuire said, as weird and as odd as the times were, that stood out in his life. He had everything, but he had nothing. And that's basically what Zophar is saying here. He's saying, you know, the evil, their life just, it just passes by quickly. And they don't ever have peace. They never have joy. They never have the things that they would desire. And they can't because they don't have a relationship with God. So what he's saying concerning that subject is correct. They're miserable. What we have is a knowledge of in the New Testament how that the way to have hope and peace and joy is through relationship with Jesus Christ. But he's saying evil is sweet to this hypocrite. He he relishes it. He devours it. He savors it. He loves it. He's saying that's what evil is to him. He says in verse 15, he swallows down riches and vomits them up again. God casts them out of his belly. When it says he swallows down riches, that speaks of greedily gorging himself. But as he's gorging himself, he vomits them back up. God causes them to come out. So he's greedily gorging himself, but he can't keep the riches. In Ecclesiastes 2, 18 and 19, I hated all my labor in which I had toiled under the sun because I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will rule over all my labor in which I toiled and in which I have shown myself wise under the sun. This is vanity. I'm going to leave my stuff to somebody who may not even use it rightly. I've seen that. Some of you who've been around for a while have seen that kind of thing, where somebody receives something, a lot of riches, and they don't know how to budget. They don't know how to use it. And before you know it, they're out there buying all kinds of things, and they go broke within a couple of years. I've seen seen there's, there's shows that say, whatever happened to these lottery winners? And you look at the show, and they'll say, this guy bought boats, and he bought houses, and within a year and a half, he had spent $20 million and had nothing to show for it. It happens, and that's basically what, what the writer of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, was saying. He said, I'm thinking, I've worked so hard all this time, all my life, to accumulate things. He says, and then I, it hit me, I have to leave it behind to somebody else. In Luke chapter 12, verses 15 through 21, Jesus said this. He said, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I'll do this. I'll pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Eat. Drink and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You've laid up all of these things that you intend to spend and to use for your own pleasure. But I'm going to take you tonight. And then who's going to end up with it? And so basically, that's what's being said. He swallows down riches, vomits them up again. God casts them out of his belly. Verse 16, he will suck the poison of cobras. The viper's tongue will slay him. So that which he had thought was pleasing, that which he was devouring, actually turns around and destroys him. In verse 17, he says he will not see the streams the rivers flowing with honey and cream. Things that he should enjoy won't bring him any pleasure. He will, verse 18, he will restore that for which he labored and will not swallow it down. 
from the proceeds of business. He will get no enjoyment, for he has oppressed and forsaken the poor. He's violently seized a house which he didn't build. He's living in a way he shouldn't live because he didn't earn much of what he had. This could be a, um, uh, an insult to Job because Job was so very wealthy and all, and he may be calling him uh, a man who had taken things that didn't belong to him. So things his laborers work for, things that he worked for, end up in somebody else's possession because, this is what Zophar is saying, he didn't gain his wealth honestly and he didn't do it legitimately. In verse 20, because he knows no quietness in his heart. He will not save anything he desires. He has no quietness in his heart. Because of his greed, his lack of concern for others, he will not retain anything. He has no inner peace. His greed drives him to material gain. His greed drives him constantly. And because his greed drives him constantly, he never finds a place to rest. There was a song many years ago, I, I won't bore you with the title or anything other than we'll say that one of the lines in the song stuck out to me and I've never, never really forgotten how he was saying you have, you have roses in your garden, but do you ever take the time to go out there and even smell them? He says, you have children, and they play in the yard. Do you even take the time to step out and watch your children as they enjoy themselves in life? He says, no, you're a rich man. He says, and for you, the only thing you pursue is a little bit more. And all the things that would have given you joy, it's the heart of the song, you ignored because you saw them with no value, of having no value. You know, and... I think a lot of people can do that. I think a lot of people can acquire things. If I have this, if I only had that, okay, I got that, but in order to have that, I should have this to go along with that. So we're always on a treadmill, always moving forward. You know, I'll be honest with you, I, I don't speak down to anybody in this because, frankly, I've, I've had to deal with that in my own life more than once, more than once, where I, 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 I've awakened to the thought, When's the last time you just sat outside in your backyard? For me, I never do that. I never do that. And when Marie and I were ill recently, um, you know, for us just to get out of the house is a big thing. And so I went out and I put out, a, there's a chair, a lawn chair, and I sat down and I felt the sun and I started talking to the Lord. I said, I keep myself so busy that sometimes I don't even enjoy the pleasures of just sitting, enjoying your creation and enjoying the backyard that somebody else has to mow. <laughs> Marie does a good job. <laughs> When's the last time you were able to rest? The last time that you went into your backyard and just sat there and just listened to the birds and just saw the roses I have rose, rose bushes in my backyard. I have fruit trees. They bear fruit. The fruit falls off. I never eat it. And it hit me. So there's an orange tree. I have an orange tree. I go out and I took the orange off, opened it up, ate it. It was sour. So I made some orange juice for my wife. No idea. <laughs> but God was speaking to me in that because you know what? Sometimes you just got to stop. Sometimes you just have to stop, take a breath, look around, and enjoy yourself. Because a lot of people never do, and again, I'm telling you, I understand that I do the same thing. You can be driven to get this or to do that or perform this, and, and you just don't enjoy it. You can be driven. Well, in the particular that he's speaking of, the particular individual whom he refers to as a hypocrite, he says, your greed is, is driving you around constantly, therefore you never rest. In Proverbs 23, verse 4, here's a warning. Do not wear yourself out to get rich. Have the wisdom to show restraint. Proverbs 13, 11, wealth gained by dishonesty will be diminished, but he who gathers by labor will increase. Don't drive yourself, but work and have self-discipline. 
he says in verse 21, nothing is left for him to eat, therefore his well-being will not last. He didn't live a disciplined lifestyle, and he ends up with nothing. In verse 22, in his self-sufficiency, he will be in distress. Every hand of misery will come against him. Even when he's doing well, he's saying he's under pressure. Those whom he has oppressed will constantly be turning on him. So in saying this, he may, he may be alluding to what Job had said in, in chapter 19, verse 14, because you're losing everybody. There's nobody around for you anymore. And he had said in verse 14 in chapter 19, my relatives have failed, my close friends have forgotten me. Those who dwell in my house and my maidservants count me as a stranger. I'm an alien in their sight. So he may be alluding to that, saying that he has oppressed them. In verse 23, when he's about to fill his stomach, God will cast on him the fury of his wrath and, and will rain, rain it on him while he's eating. Uh, he's about to eat to his own satisfaction. But God is going to feed him food he doesn't want to eat. God's fury, he says, is going to rain on him. It's going to drown him. It's a picture of swift judgment. Now, again, that's something he's saying. God sometimes will move quickly and swiftly to bring judgment. And he's saying God will do that to the hypocrite. In verse 24, he will flee from the iron weapon. A bronze bow will pierce him through. It is drawn and comes out of the body. Yes, the glittering point comes out of his gall. Terrors come upon him. He's going to be under constant stress. He's going to be fleeing sword and spear. He's going to think that he's safe. But once he feels he's safe, he's saying danger, greater danger will overtake him. It, it speaks in verse 25 as, as it, it is drawn and comes out of his body. He's speaking of wounds, wounds that he receives that are many and are deadly. He speaks of the terrors of death. The terrors of death will be upon him. He'll see his wounds and be afraid. So to total darkness, verse 26, is reserved for his treasures. An unfanned fire will consume him. It shall go ill with him who is left in his tent. All kinds of miseries are laid up for him. Total darkness is reserved for his treasures. Treasures In Romans 2, I just wrote, read this a moment ago, but I'll remind you, it speaks of treasures. It's reserved for his treasures. Well, there is something that he is treasuring, and he's laying up as a treasure, and it says in Romans 2, verse 5, in Accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you're treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath, revelation of the righteous judgment of God. You actually, when you don't know the Lord every day that you're in sin, every day that you continue to reject him, you're actually storing up wrath that gives God more to judge you for. And sometimes people don't realize that. The longer you live, the more sin you commit. It's just basic truth you know it's been said there's no sinner like an old sinner you know you keep on sinning and you basically get in the pattern of sin but you're treasuring up wrath for the day of wrath the longer you you live without coming to faith in christ the greater the the judgment that comes upon you he speaks about an unfanned fire an unfanned fire in verse 26 will consume him it shall go ill with him who is left in his tent an unfanned fire an unfanned fire is a fire that is not started by a man. It's, it's really a picture of God starting the fire himself. And so this fire that God has started himself, it's, well, it's going to bring pun, uh, punishment to him and pain to him. It's going to go ill with him, but it'll also go ill with his family because they're going to inherit all the damage that he experienced. You do leave behind something to your family. We all know that. What is it that you're going to leave behind? I, uh, I've said this so many times, I don't have to say it more than just a few words. I want to leave a legacy to my, my children and my grandchildren. I don't want to leave something for them to be ashamed of. I don't want to be the kind of man that, that had a bad reputation and so my children have to live with that bad reputation that I left behind as my legacy. 
I want to I le- I leave behind something that they can take joy in and be blessed by. I want to live in such a way that even my, my smallest grandchildren would be able to say something kind about their grandfather. I was sharing with the men just this Saturday something that touched my heart and blessed me, so I shared it with the guys in the message that I brought on Saturday. How that I have a, a, a granddaughter who is, a, I think she's seven now, and uh, she I hadn't seen her for a while, so she made a little card for me, a little handwritten card, and uh, it was for, for me and for Grammy. And in it, she said, I like you because. I think that's rather cute when a kid's trying to figure out why they like you. And I was sharing with the guys. I said, you know, one of the things that she said that touched my heart, I'll share it with you. She says, I like you because you're honest. And that made me feel really good. It really did. Because my granddaughter sees something in her grandfather that she thinks is good. And the thing she thinks is good is that her papa is honest. Those are the things that you want for your kids. Because a long time ago, I think all of us, and I'm speaking, just thinking of it as I speak, you can leave behind a lot of things because the fact is, is you leave behind a lot of things. And the only thing that you have waiting for you is what you lay up. And so for me, I want to leave behind a legacy. I want to leave behind for my children and my grandchildren, and should God bless us with great-grandchildren, I want to leave behind a name that they can, they can look at and say, my grandfather, my grandmother were good people. And it doesn't have to be, you know, a house, and it doesn't have to be you know, a cool car. It doesn't have to be any of that. It, it, what has, it has to be is something that matters. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses of what Jesus said. My life isn't made up of the small objects and things that I've accumulated over a lifetime. Everything is left behind and everything perishes with the using. The only things that last are the things that you impart to your children, your grandchildren, a wife or a husband for that matter, that, that has eternal value. And those things matter. And, even, and when this man is speaking to Job, he's trying to remind him of these things. But the problem is, he's accusing Job of things that Job hasn't done. And yet, at the same time, what he's saying, well, there's truth in it. There's truth. He says, it's going to go ill with the hypocrite and all of that. That's what he's saying. Well, I don't want to be a hypocrite. He says in verse 27, the heavens will reveal his iniquity. The earth will rise up against him. In other words, God will bring judgment. And finally, in verse 28 and 29, the increase of his his house will depart. His goods will flow away in the day of his wrath. This is a portion from God for a wicked man, the heritage appointed to him by God. And so whatever he has laid up for his children whatever he has laid up for his grandchildren, the things that he was so desirous of accumulating, he's saying all of that will be taken away. He's going to lose everything because that, he's saying, is God's judgment on the wicked. And again, much of what he is saying is true, but there's one problem. Job hasn't been guilty. He hasn't done this. It amazes me at how sure these men are of what Job, they're, they're saying that he's a hypocrite, that, that he's lost his children because of his sin, that he's lost his honor because of his sin, that he's suffering illness because of his sin. But Job hasn't done those things. It's amazing to me how quickly they looked at him and said to him, you are reaping what you've sown. And Job is in so much pain, and I'll close with this thought. As I think of it, again, you've got to picture Job. Job's body has been destroyed, his skin and bones. Everything that he had has basically been taken from him. His children have been taken from him. His possessions have been taken from him. His wife's respect. She was to the point where she said, 
you know, I would just as soon you be dead. Curse God and die. How long will you hold fast to your integrity? Curse him and die, Job. Just get it over with. I can't take it. My pain in my heart to see you in this way. And then Job has been muttering to his friends and he's been saying, I was, I was the man who would walk into a room and, and, and the children would become quiet and the men would stand up and the aged, those who are wise and well-respected, they're the ones who respected me. And here you are, my friends, telling me I'm guilty of a sin, but you, it's easy for you to say that I've done something wrong because you haven't done something wrong in your own mind. And you see this argument going on. And so his friend has been telling him, you, you are a hypocrite and, and you're reaping what you've sown. And, and I've seen this in life and I'm giving you ancient wisdom and things you think you know, but you really don't. So let me remind you. But Job hasn't done everything that he's saying. Much of what he's saying again is true. But it doesn't apply to him. Be very, very slow to give advice. Be very slow to be telling people what they're doing wrong. Be very slow in that. You might find this interesting, but yes, I'm a pastor, and yes, I've been walking with the Lord for a long time, but no, I don't impose myself on people. And if they're going through pain, I don't look at them and say, oh, I can tell you why. Look at you. I guess when you've lived long enough, you've realized, but by the grace of God, I could do anything that anybody else could do. Who am I to judge somebody else, right? And as I watch Job's friends giving him the remedy, Job's already said, it's easy for you. You're in perfect health. Everything's fine with you. It's easy for you to tell me what I should be doing. It always is when somebody's living very comfortably. But what you need to do is show some compassion and have some pity. And you've got to understand, it's the hand of the Lord that is against me. It isn't something I've done. I'm not reaping what I've sown. God, for some reason, has used me as his target, has become an adversary. I haven't done anything the way you think I have. I haven't. I guess every person in this room at one time or another, if it hasn't happened, it will, has been the victim of somebody saying you've done something that you haven't done. Try and defend yourself. Try and clear it. And they just look at you thinking, you wouldn't even be arguing with me if you weren't guilty. And a long time ago, a friend of mine said to me, you know what? In ministry, there'll be a lot of things said, so don't defend yourself. Just allow the Lord to. Well, in the case of Job, these guys have been piling on, and he's finally arguing his own case, and he's saying, I haven't done the things that you say I've done. I'm not guilty of the sins you're accusing me of. The hand of God has been turned against me. So far, they don't believe him, but eventually, we'll see what happens.